And now we are in the fortunate position that both speakers are present. So uh, I feel pretty relaxed. And I'm happy to see our two, yeah, or I could say, distinct speakers. And both of you from North America, I could say. You from Canada, but right now based in Paris. Thanks for the yeah, 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 you may say so, <laughs> at least for a while. And I thought that you had signed your book from Christian Zurich, one of the Virgin Islands, yes. yeah, former Danish, former Danish. Yeah, yeah, colonies. So or, could I call you ghost Danish? <laughs> <laughs> so here we are in a relaxed atmosphere, I'm sure, but uh, the theme is serious. And it's a pleasure to welcome you, Mark. Uh, uh, this conference, and I know that you will be much better to introduce your topic and, in fact, also yourself. So please feel yourself welcome. You have 20 minutes, and we look forward. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jesper. Um, this is uh, something that has been written with uh, Brett Fiebiger, who was a uh, postdoc. Uh, at the University <coughs> of Ottawa uh, for about uh, nine months. In part, it's a response to some of the criticism that uh, Peter Scott has uh, addressed to some of the ideas that uh, some of us have been discussing. So the title is Non-Capacity Generating Semi-Autonomous Expenditures, and uh, wow. <laughs> that seems quite complicated. Uh, and I'll be explaining uh, a bit uh, what that is and what, uh, what's interesting about it. Um, the topic is related to the debate that has been going on with respect to whether uh, demand or economic activity is wage-led or profit-led. Uh, so there's the empirical debate, uh, which involves some, some um, Kaleskians generally uh, say that uh, at least the domestic economy is uh, demand-led, uh, sorry, is wage-led, and, uh, and then usually it's people more influenced <coughs> by uh, Marx and view who say that it is profit-led. Uh, but in my view, there's something which is being omitted, it's uh, overhead labor or what is sometimes called supervisory uh, workers, and we'll see uh, what, what is the implication of taking into account overhead labor. Then there's the theoretical debate. Uh, there are some people in the past who have argued that the economy cannot be uh, profit-led. Um, uh, some say, for instance, that because of the gestation lag, the time lag between the decision to invest and uh, the, the actual investment that uh, as, a, as a consequence uh, an increase in wages would lead to an increase in consumption and, uh, and then by the time investment would occur, uh, profits would have been risen. So this was a, in fact an argument that was made by uh, Kazimir Waski who, uh, in fact, was a co-author of Badouri, the from the famous Badouri and Martin. Uh, there's also the, a view uh, around uh, consumption reacting to, uh, well, relative consumption. So that's the so-called Veblen Duesenberry view, uh, which argues that even if it seems to be profit-led, in fact, it, it it is not. And then finally, there's this non-capacity creating autonomous demand that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so the, there's, uh, I mean, over, over the last few years, there's been a revival of the so-called Sraffian super multiplier view, which was put forward by Franklin Serrano uh, 20 years ago and by Heinz Bortis. And uh, what are these, uh, what is it related to? It's related to uh, expenditures which are uh, non-capacity creating in the sense 
So basically, it's not a uh, fixed investment. So it could be residential investment, it could be consumer expenditures financed uh, by debt, it could be government expenditures, and it could be export. So there's been a number of papers we have, which have been written about this recently. You have a list here. And you can see that it involves uh, a large number of uh, well-known uh, post-Kingdoms. And you had a presentation yesterday by uh, one of the persons here, by Lydia Broshi. Um, now, um, yeah, the discussion is usually around uh, medium run uh, growth, but the, the discussion can also arise around business cycles. So there are two views one could say about how these business cycles are being generated. Uh, one is tied to is uh, residential investment, uh, or what I call uh, non-capacity creating semi-autonomous expenditures, so for short NC, yeah, NCC SAE. <laughs> And uh, that's, that's a point of view which you can find uh, by Howard Sherman. So him, despite being a Marxian, has a rather Keynesian view of uh, how these business cycles are being generated. And the other is the econometrician Ed Lehmer, who argues uh, that the business cycle is essentially driven by residential investment. And then uh, there's the other view, which is that the business cycle is driven by corporate investment. So what you have is a Goodwin cycle, uh, where you have a profit-led economy. And, and then at some point, uh, because the economy is doing so well, the argument is that the level of employment or the wage share gets uh, so high that there is a profit squeeze, and then you get the, the turnaround. So this view has been uh, defended in particular <coughs> by Peter Scott, who is here, and uh, by uh, usually people who are linked with the new school in New York. Um, so, one, one thing we can uh, look at, or we can wonder, is uh, what component is the most volatile? So usually in Keynesian economics, we assume that investment is the most uh, volatile component. And uh, indeed, if we compare the investment component <coughs> to the consumption component, then uh, yeah, we do get this uh, impression. So. If I uh, look at uh, personal consumption expenditures, we can see that uh, if we look at the annual growth rates, at least for the U.S. economy, we can see that it, it changes, but, <coughs> but not that much if we compare to gross private domestic investment, where uh, it can go from uh, plus 27 to minus 21. On the other hand, if we uh, separate uh, fixed investment by looking at non-residential investment and residential investment, then what we see is that residential investment is much more vol volatile than is uh, non-residential investment. It's much more volatile than uh, exports or uh, imports. So uh, certainly if we want to understand the business cycle, then it seems that uh, we should focus more, perhaps, on uh, residential investment than on uh, corporate uh, investment. So that's one argument. Another argument is that if we're looking, okay, the recessions are these uh, slightly gray uh, vertical bands. If we are, we're looking at the evolution of uh, household fixed investment and uh, consumer credit, uh, then uh, it appears that uh, these, I mean, this is what I call the sum of those two things. 
uh, is what I call non-capacity creating um, semi-autonomous expenditures. Semi-autonomous, of course, because they are not fully autonomous. And what we can see is that usually uh, the recession uh, occurs after a fall in uh, residential investment, as is the case almost everywhere here, there, and of course the last uh, in 2006-2008 two, uh, here we have the uh, consumer credit so uh, again this is another um, argument where uh, we could say that uh, what's really driving the cycle is not so much corporate investment it's really uh, residential investment. Um, uh, here, um, Brett looked at the correlation coefficients uh, between the change in the share of profits relative to GDP and the share of uh, various components that we have here. Yeah, uh, through time, so, you know, uh, to, with a la uh, lags of two, or, uh, and what we see is, okay, those two here are related to, um, well, real household gross fixed investment, or real household gross fixed investment plus the change in consumer credit. And what we see is that, uh, the relationship with profits are contemporaneous. So profits or the share profits goes up when these expenditures or plus the change in consumer credit when, when they, they go up. And the same if we look at the relationship between those <coughs> two uh, things here and GDP, we can see also that the greatest correlation is contemporaneous or, or slightly uh, before. Uh, whereas if we look at uh, real corporate gross fixed investment, what we see is that uh, the, the highest correlation with the, the changes in the share of profits is uh, lag, meaning that corporate, uh, corporate investment Okay. The, the best correlation is with uh, profits as they occur two periods before, two quarters before. <coughs> and uh, the same happens uh, with rela the relationship with GDP. So GDP <coughs> goes up first and then corporate investment uh, goes up. And, you know, whether whether you use this definition or whether you use real private non-residential fixed investment, you get uh, very <coughs> similar results. So uh, again, uh, this is a, an argument to, to say that uh, profits move mostly with, or changes in profits move mostly with changes in residential investment and that uh, corporate um, corporate investment reacts so to speak to the level of GDP so we, we may suspect the rate of utilization and react to uh, profit <coughs> react to economic activity so again the, 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 the cycle business cycle is driven by this residential <coughs> investment and these consumption expenditures financed by um, credit. <coughs> um, here we, again, another way to look at this, um, quarterly annualized real growth rates. Uh, so here, this is, you can see these large changes in, um, Household, uh, household residential uh, investment and those consumer expenditures, well, consumer credit, changes in consumer credit. 
whereas this line here in gray represents corporate investment. And so you can see that it doesn't, I mean, it does change through the cycle, but it's not as volatile as, uh, as these changes, which are linked more to what's going on in the household sector rather than the corporate sector. Okay, so uh, this is to underline the importance of, uh, <coughs> of this residential investment. The, the alternative view is, uh, is based on the Goodwin uh, cycle, which can be represented in this way. So the argument is usually <coughs> that we start from this position here, where the rate of utilization or the rate of employment <coughs> is very low and so is the profit share which is very low and then somehow uh, the economy moves from stage one to stage two to stage three and so and, and up to stage four and, and then the rate of utilization and the or, the or the rate of employment and the share of profit uh, move together so this is the argument that the economy is profit led and then, uh, at some point, uh, the profit share starts to go down, presumably because the bargaining power of workers is uh, larger. And then, as a consequence, we reach a peak where, uh, <coughs> from there on, the economic activity goes down, the rate of unemployment, uh, of utilization, sorry, goes down, the rate of employment goes down. And we go back all, all the way from 5, 6, 7, 8, back to stage 9. Um, so the, the argument which uh, Kaleskians make to explain this uh, is different from the one usually given. The argument is usually based on overhead, uh, on overhead labor costs. The fact that when, if the rate of utilization goes up, then uh, the overhead labor cost per unit goes down because by definition overhead labor cost is a fixed cost and therefore the share of profit goes up. So it's not surprising that we, we get this, uh, this move and then uh, that when the economy is uh, going into a recession, then it goes back into reverse gear and uh, the share profit goes down. Um, you, usually what is said is that the, the so usually what is said is that corporate profits, which we have here, so here I have one business cycle, but we get kind of similar figures looking at previous business cycles. So uh, the, the, here we have uh, a clockwise uh, relationship between corporate profits and uh, the rate of utilization. So it goes like this. And usually what is being claimed <coughs> is that um, investment uh, goes in the same uh, clockwise shape. So it does, if you look at household residential investment, and this other line here takes also into account the change in consumer credit, so it does uh, go in this clockwise uh, way. But if we look at corporate investment, it, it, it is anti-clockwise, counterclockwise. And so uh, this, uh, it seems to us, um, is uh, one way to uh, reject the, the standard Goodwin interpretation. So as I said, what is the Goodwin cycle view? Well, uh, usually it's the one which I just said, is, is that uh, there's a crisis because the rate of employment is too high, the real wage uh, is too high, and the profit share becomes too low. Now there's a few I mean, if you don't accept this interpretation, there's, there's a few puzzles that one uh, would see, which is when you get to the, the bottom of the, uh, at, at 
the, at the end of the recession, at the bottom of the recession, why would firms expand productive capacity uh, when they are bulging in idle capacity? And also, since the profit share uh, and even the profit rate is so low, why would firms uh, start uh, investing when the, when the profit share is at its lowest or, or almost uh, lowest? So it's a little bit uh, puzzling when you look at it from this way. Uh, and as, as we say here, those who endorse this answer also ask us to imagine that all expenditures on current output originate within the firm sector and to disregard the role of external markets and finance to influence growth and <coughs> cycles. So in the Goodwin uh, model, there's no financial stocks, no channel for the rate of interest, no public sector, uh, no foreign sector, no inventory dynamics, no dwelling investment, no debt finance consumption, no overhead labor, and an investment function that reduces decisions on output and accumulation down to a negative relation with the rate of employment. So given all this, it seems a little bit I mean, it would be remarkable if such a model did have strong empirical support, uh, given its abstraction from the, the world of complexity. Um, so, uh, the fact that there is a pro-cyclical profit share, uh, which is the, usually the argument given to, to provide support for the Goodwin view, uh, in our in our opinion is insufficient uh, yes there is this shape um, but it seems to be more related to residential investment and not corporate investment there's also an alternative explanation which has been provided in a paper by Hammer and uh, Mitchell <coughs> where they they get pseudo uh, Goodwin cycles which are generated by financial fragility <coughs> in the firm sector uh, ironically, using a model uh, that was presented by Peter Scott in 1994. <laughs> so it, there's this irony here. Um, and uh, here instead, we, we believe that, uh, at least in the US, but I think it's also the case in Canada, and uh, I just read a, a paper <coughs> about China where I read that uh, residential construction represents approximately 10% of GDP, uh, according to the author. So uh, we kind of uh, tend to agree with Lemur, which uh, has uh, a paper published. Well, no, it's not published. It was an NBER paper claiming that housing is the business uh, cycle. OK, so what we are arguing is that uh, it seems to us that the super multiplier mechanism is uh, does give us some insights about the effect of secular trends and in uh, in dwelling investment or in other semi-autonomous expenditures <coughs> on the secular growth rate there's also uh, this business cycle uh, dimension which uh, we think has been overlooked uh, by uh, a lot of economists including uh, post keynesian economists and uh, that's it. I think we have to, uh, and, and certainly it was also omitted by uh, Hyman Minsky, who, who focused on uh, problems of leverage and debt for the corporate sector, but, but completely omitted what was going on in the uh, household sector. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, taking into consideration that the topics which the two presenters have today are quite different. Of course, they relate to post Keynesian economics, both of them, but quite different. I will just uh, ask if there are any urgent questions related to uh, this uh, what <coughs> presentation which just because then we could take them right now, brief, adjust, so you're 
just sitting here, and then you get frustrated because you cannot have a frustrated audience. Um, No one will admit to such a thing. No, no, no. To run the risk of being frustrated. Yes. That's very understandable. There is. Yes. Warren. Yes. Yes. I, I don't. I, I think right. it's on. Otherwise, you could speak out. Okay. So, um, not sure what the what to ask it, but is there any consideration given as one of the models? Is oh, does one of the models include the idea that? During an upturn, for example, the profits would be very different if firms do their own investment in-house rather than buy investment goods from outside firms. So for example, if General Motors did their own investment in-house and built their own drill presses, that would show up as an expense that would be capitalized over a certain period of time. However, if they bought them from Ingersoll Rand, that would be a profit for Ingersoll Rand a cost for General Motors that's only amortized over time. So only the profit would be a little bit higher in the amortization. So it would give you a distortion in the profit cycle on the upside, which would be made up on the downside when the whole thing reverses. I don't know, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> that's my quick answer. <laughs> I, I think it's critical for looking at those, some of that, that last year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, then keep your questions also for Mark to the end of the session, because then I will switch. And it is an honor for me to welcome you. Oh, wait, 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 because I have something more to say. Because there are many reasons why you are here. But one of the reasons. The weather. No, please. <laughs> That's the least and the worst. And I cannot be excused for the weather. That's not my responsibility. But anyhow, no, no, no worry. Never. Just relax. You will get the word <laughs> later on. But your book has been translated into Danish. And I'm very pleased with the outcome. And well, the front is lovely. Not all of you can enjoy the Danish title, De Sydrebne Naive Bedrag i Økonomisk Politik, but it is a translation of your previous book from uh, 2010, Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy. And uh, I think that could be a title for your presentation right now. Okay. Am I right? It's close. It's very close. Yes, I thought so. <laughs> and if the slides and the slides are well on its way, yes. Yes, you have added and the history of thought. Yes. Yes. Even better. I think I should stop and leave the word to you. Be yourself welcome. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else here I know that don't recognize because it's been so long? I have been invited. So what do I do with this? Put it over here. Okay, thank you very much, and it's nice to be here for the introduction of the book. Uh, I, I used to think I was post-Keynesian at one time, however, I, I, think the, I think I was rejected by the post-Keynesians quite a while ago, but I still feel comfortable here. Uh, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is a uh, continuation of something that started in Italy. I was at Bergamo with... Uh, Professor uh, Joe Langs, uh, Ricardo Bellafiore. And he had me hold a session to discuss how uh, MMT economics <coughs> might fit into the history of thought and what contributions it may have made. And these will be, uh, so I'll be using things that are in the book, but putting them in that context. So, I, and what I've done, because uh, for some of you, uh, New to this? Has anybody read my book or not read it? Who hasn't read it? Okay. What's that? 
Who has not? Who has not? Who has not? Okay, quite a few people. So, I'll, so without many who have not, I'll, I'll uh, work into it slowly. So, my wife and I were visiting Pompeii uh, two years ago. Yeah, for about twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah, twenty minutes. And the guy was showing us around, and he showed us these coins. He said these coins were found. In, in the ashes, and they would have been in people's pockets, well, where it would have been in people's pockets, and <coughs> merchants, and homes. And Pompeii was a very nice place to live because they had very good public services, sanitation, aqueducts, public safety. And what they would do is they would collect these coins for tax, and then they would uh, go out and use them to pay the public service workers to, to get everything done. So taxes were high, but it was very popular. People liked to be there because of the good public services. And so, you know, I'm always a little bit of a troublemaker. And I said, well, well, you know, actually, the government would spend the coin first, and then they would collect the tax. And he goes, no, 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 no. You collect the tax, and then you pay the people. So I said, well, where do coins come from? He says, well, the government made them. <laughs> so I said, well, how did anybody get the coin to pay the tax? And he goes, so you're saying they would spend the coin first to pay people and then collect the tax? I go, well, yeah, how else could it work? And he goes, no, 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 he walked away. <laughs> <laughs> now, I guarantee you, everybody in Pompeii knew that they, you know, which way, that they paid the people first and then collected the tax. And so from that, I'm going to be referring back to this um, as I go through things that are in the book and, uh, and, and their own. Uh, the contribution to the history of thought. The first thing is the currency itself, the coin, is a tax credit. It's the thing that the government demanded for payment of taxes. Okay, and this came up in soft currency economics in 1993, which brought me to my first post-Keynesian conference through a man named Bill Vickery, who I had met at a Social Policy Institute in New York. I said, is there anybody else who might think like this? And he said, well, there's this group called the Post-Keynesians. You might want to look them up, which I did. So. Uh, Bill later won a Nobel Prize and unfortunately died the next day. Yeah. Okay, so, and the other thing that came out of soft currency economics, which I'll show how it relates to Pompeii, is that government debt functions as interest rate support and not funding. At the time, it was just presumed that the reason governments borrowed in their own currency was to get the money to spend. And soft currency economics pointed out how, in the book, picked up on it, how that's not what's going on, that's not the case, that the reason for government securities is to, to uh, provide interest rate support. Without government interference, such as securities or paying interest on reserves, the policy rate is zero. The natural rate in that sense, not in the economic sense, is zero. And the only reason rates are higher is because government is pushing up rates through some kind of support operation, either paying interest on reserves, which wasn't done in 93, or through government securities, which was done. Okay. And, the, um, and that the currency itself is nothing more than a tax credit. Back then, none of the books said that. Nobody knew what money was. They knew what it did, meaning of exchange, store value, but they didn't know what it was. Okay. The next thing is the source of the price level, which is, uh, is connected to inflation. <laughs> And again, I think that came from soft currency economics and from MMT, and that is the currency itself is a simple public monopoly. Okay? There's a course of tax put on by the government, and it's payable in something only they can produce. That is, the funds to pay taxes come from the government. Okay? And monopolists are necessarily price setters. That's your first class in, in micro. And so the value of the currency is what the government says you have to do to get it from the government, it's the terms of exchange. We also know from micro that monopolists set two prices. One, how this item exchanges for itself, called the own rate, and uh, lots of Austrian economists dig into what all the own rates are for all the different commodities. But for the currency itself, the own rate is the interest rate, which of course is set by the central bank. Okay, they're the monopoly supplier of reserves, and therefore they're uh, price setter for the interest rate. It's not a market thing. Uh, I was at a meeting once with Chairman Bernanke, and just three of us, four of us, his aide, and he made the statement that when investment picks up, it'll use up the available funds and drive up the interest rate. Okay. It's like, okay, <laughs> I didn't want to comment on that. But 
This guy's been, this was when he had already been vice chairman of the Fed, he was at the White House, about to become Fed chairman. I guess he didn't understand that the only time the rate went up is when they raised their hands and voted for a higher rate. <laughs> there wasn't any invisible hand, it was his hand that <laughs> was setting the interest rate. Okay, they also set how an item exchanges for itself. The government does that when it spends. And so, the way I say it is that the price level is necessarily a function of prices paid by the government okay, when it spends, or closely related collateral demanded when it wins, which is why it requires the banking system to have strict requirements on loans. Now, let's go back to Pompeii and look, and look at this. So what were they actually doing? Uh, in Pompeii. Okay, they wanted the people to work for the government. So how did they get them out of the economy, the private sector, into the public sector? All right, so what they did was they put a tax out. Now, for this example, I'll just say a house, a house tax, a house tax on everybody's house. In their coin, which was a worthless piece of metal otherwise. It had no intrinsic value. Okay, so the first thing they do is levy a tax. Because if they just offered their coins, there wouldn't be anybody there who would want to work for those coins. They had no reason to do it. Okay? So there was no unemployment. We define unemployment as people looking for paid work. So the first thing they have to do is create unemployment. They have to create people looking for paid work, looking for their coin. So they put a tax on. The purpose of the tax and the purpose of all are the taxation functions first to create unemployment. Okay, so they put a tax on it which creates people looking for paid work, and then they could hire those people uh, to uh, work for the government. Right? So first is a tax liability, then people come to work and they pay them, and then the tax gets paid. <coughs> now notice they found those coins I showed laying around. Well, how did they get there? Well, I'll say obviously, the government spent more coins than it collected. Otherwise, they wouldn't be sitting around on the streets today to be found. They wouldn't be in people's homes. They wouldn't be in businesses, in people's pockets. Okay. The government ran a deficit. They, if they found 20,000 coins in people's possessions in, in Pompeii, it means they spent 20,000 more than they collected. It means the tax might have been, I don't know, 20,000 coins a year, and they maybe spent 18 or 9, I'm sorry. The tax might have been 20,000, maybe they spent 22 or 23,000 hiring people. The coins they spent but did not collect in tax that had not yet been collected, that's the deficit, that is the net, those are the net financial assets in the society that run the commerce and you know, the financial equity for the credit structure. Okay, and the government deficit is equal to the net financial assets, the savings in the economy. I like to say that the, the Public debt is the accounting record of the net savings in the economy of that currency. So let me move ahead here. So we'll go through this in a more organized sequence. And one contribution we, I believe has been made is that the cause of unemployment is taxation, unemployment as defined. You know, when I asked Ricardo about Marx and if he had ever pointed out anywhere that the cause of the unemployment was taxation, he said he said he'd never seen it before. He's a pretty good Marxian scholar. Okay. The government desires to provision itself. It levies a tax. Why? Not to collect the coins. It's got the coins. It's got the money. But to offer, <coughs> to cause people to offer real goods and services in exchange for that which it requires for payment of taxes. That makes the currency a tax credit. The government can now provision itself by spending its otherwise worthless currency. Unemployment is necessarily the evidence that the tax created more unemployed than the government wanted to hire. It made a mistake. I can't think of any other reason you would do that. You want to hire so many people, you put out a tax, you come up with a wage, you blend it to the tax, you, you, you use division, and you know how many hours you're going to get, and all of a sudden you get more people than that show up. Unemployment is more than you want to hire. Okay? And so, so what do you do? You either lower the tax or you hire those extra people. You make a fiscal adjustment. Okay, but it's caused by government <coughs> policy. Okay. Public debt, which we just talked about, um, when, when the government spends money, those funds are either used to pay taxes or they're not. If they're not used to pay taxes, they sit as net financial assets in the economy until someday when they are used, if ever, to pay taxes, and they remain outstanding. 
Now, what he follows, the other important point is that the funds to pay taxes can only come from the government. They can't come from anywhere else. Or it's designated agents, which today includes the banking system, which are all members of the Federal Reserve, which is an agent of Congress. Uh, <coughs> and even when the um, taxes are paid, you can go to the bank, borrow money, get a loan, pay your taxes. You say, oh, I'm paying the bank money, not the government's money. Number one, the bank is a government agent authorized to do that because it has sufficient capital collateralizing that money or the government won't do it. Number two, when you make that payment, your bank's reserve account gets debited at the Fed, and that credit and reserve account can only come from the central bank. And so in that sense, the, the funds to pay taxes came from the central bank. And if, there's an over, if that creates an overdraft in that reserve account, that overdraft loan, an overdraft is a loan, that loan came from the Federal Reserve, which is the government. So no matter how you look at it, the funds to pay taxes come only from the government. That monopoly position is 100% secure. Uh, okay. the public debt's the accounting record of the net savings of tax credits retained by the economy. It's called debt because tax credits outstanding are classified as government liabilities for accounting purposes. <coughs> They've agreed to take these things for payment of taxes, makes them a liability, falls under the general category of debt. Just like any bank liability falls under the category of debt. And the public debt is a component, and I'd say important component, of what, I, what can be called the money supply, just loosely. I recognize the definitions aren't there. The little chart I use, <coughs> guess where I used it last? <laughs> I don't want to make a new one. This is for Italy. You've got the economy in the middle. Okay, the government wants to provision itself. <coughs> it levies a tax. In this case, 90. And I'm going to look at this from two ways. First from the economy and then from the government. So the economy has to pay a tax of 90, so it sends people to work for the state. They earn 100. It all goes into the bank accounts. 90 goes to pay taxes, that leaves 10 sitting in the bank. And it'll be in one of three forms, cash, securities, or reserves. And so what you have is the private sector earning 100, paying 90 in taxes, net savings is 10. Okay. Looking at it from the government side, the government spends 90, uh, spends 100, which goes into the bank, 90 shifts to securities accounts, uh, 10 is left in the, in the other two accounts, and that is the government's deficit. It's the same thing in both ways. Government's deficit is equal to the net financial assets of the private sector. It's all the same number in the central bank looked at from two different sides, two different per perspectives in the economy. Okay. The neutrality of the currency. <laughs> taxation is necessarily coercive. Voluntary, voluntary taxation doesn't work. Uh, I remember when George Bush was president, a couple of top corporate guys said, you know, they should, they should, wasn't fair, the secretary was paying more tax than they were, they should pay a higher tax rate. And then President Bush said, oh, go ahead and send it in. We're, you know, you're allowed to send in more than we ask. It doesn't happen. Okay, it's not voluntary, it's coercive. The presence of taxation obviates any notion of neutrality of the currency. Money can't be neutral if there's, you know, if it's imperfect competition. Once you've got taxation, you've got imperfect competition. So that's over. The government's a single supplier of that which it demands a payment. It's a case of monopoly. It's the tightest case of imperfect competition. Okay? That obviates neutrality. Real resources are coercively moved from private to public domain. There's no neutrality going on here. And unemployment is a consequence of a monopolist withholding supply. And this is a little story of Keynes versus the classic they used to tell 20 years ago. I don't know if they still do. Uh, where the classics said, in the absence of monopoly, you can't have unemployment. And they'd point to a labor union and say, there's where your unemployment is, it's a monopoly. We've got to go out against monopolies to let markets clear so we don't have unemployment. Cain said, no, even when you don't have monopolies, you can have unemployment because of what goes on in the currency uh, with unspent income and effective demand. Okay? They were both right. It's the, uh, the classics were right. It's a monopoly that's causing the uh, unemployment. They just picked the wrong one. It's the currency monopoly. It's withholding supplies when you tax, and then you don't spend enough to cover the need to pay taxes and the desire to save. That's the, the evidence of that is unemployment. People still looking for paid work who can't find it. 
Okay, because the only things that can happen if the government spends that money is it can be used to pay tax <coughs> or it will add to savings. Okay, and Keynes was right. It was something in the monetary system, but what he never explicitly said, even though he sort of described it, <coughs> doesn't grow on trees and whatnot, it's a monopoly. He never used the word, yes, it's monopoly that causes unemployment, but it's the monopoly in the currency. And that's where your lack of effective demand comes from, the monopolist uh, constraining supply. Okay, and so that argument's been reconciled and it's behind us, right? Trade. Domestic credit funds foreign savings. And floating exchange rates assure continuous equilibrium. There are no imbalances in trade. So let's look at that quickly. So the story is that foreign savings is funding our trade deficit. They look at foreign accumulation and it's invested in treasury securities and other debt instruments and they're lending it to us and we're using that money to buy their products. It's the other way around. We all know loans create deposits in the banking system. And so if I want to buy a Toyota, a foreign car, I go to Citibank and borrow $25,000. That loan creates a deposit. I get $25,000 to spend, and I, uh, and I buy the Toyota. So I borrow $25,000. It goes in. The loan creates a deposit, which is the Toyota's account. So let's look at every, let's see, first let's see if there's any imbalance. I'm happy. I'm not out of balance. I'd rather have the car than the money, but I wouldn't have bought it. Citibank's happy. They, they're in the business to make loans. They've got a loan with me and a deposit with them. They make their 3% spread. They're happy. Toyota would rather have the money than the car or they wouldn't have sold it. And what's happened is domestic credit, my $25,000 loan, is what funded Toyota's $25,000 in savings. Okay. And the next step, of course, is Toyota wants yen to pay their employees and the Bank of Japan doesn't want the currency uh, to go up. So what they do, three minutes is change, is come in and buy dollars, sell, sell yen, and build up foreign exchange reserves. And, that's, and so it's domestic credit that funded Japan's foreign exchange reserves. Resurrecting under consumption theory. The whole idea that it's always an unspent income story is something, uh, in fact, I remember Bill Vickery coming up at a post-Keynesian conference and getting up at the board and started to explain demand leakages and, and how this works. And about two thirds of the way through, everybody told him that time was up, you have to go sit down. <laughs> this, this is it, okay? And this is something, paradox of thrift, savings and investment, sector balance, this has all been resurrected, I think, by the uh, MMT. Postscript. <clears throat> the withdrawal of the state for many areas of social life has produced growing despair in the most deprived sections of the population, dismantling public welfare, flexible markets, global competitors, increasing the misery of those who have suffered the most. It's all a consequence of the seven deadly innocent frauds of economic policy, which can now be read in Danish as well as English. Thank you very much. In some way, blaming on the states. Well, uh, the floor is open. And I see David, do you have a yes, question? Yes, yeah. maybe you better take them out. <coughs> One question, working? Hello? Yeah. One question for each of you. Uh, for Brett, uh, shouldn't you take account not just of the. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mark, I had the wrong co author. <laughs> I said, okay, I apologize. For Mark. Uh, uh, isn't it necessary to look not just at the degree of instability of the components of demand, but also their size? Because residential investment is smaller than uh, some of the others. And so greater instability would not have as big an impact as lesser instability in a larger component. And uh, for uh, Warren? I got her. Okay. I got her. Uh, uh, I'm curious, uh, do you believe that uh, during the periods in which there has been full employment in capitalist <coughs> economies, such as in some West European countries uh, for certain periods of the 1950s and 60s, during major wars, that there was no taxation? Because you said uh, taxation causes unemployment. Right, but spending eliminates the unemployment. Well, we, 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 we collect, we collect so, questions. So what does cause mean then? 
Okay, well, yes. Uh, be correct. You need a pencil? No. You sure? Oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, wait, wait. <laughs> <coughs> and you know it's Mark at the left and Warren at the right. Yes, I am. Yes, I have a question to Mark Lavoie. Uh, so, I, the, given that the residential investment seems to be leading other macroeconomic indicators, uh, I was wondering what could be the uh, determining factor for the residential investment. Would you agree that some of, some people argue that uh, maybe it's a government that doing that part, that you know, uh, arguing for more, uh, greater ownership of that the housings get more population, or you know, they sub sub subsidize the mortgage, that kind of thing. So would you agree that kind of point, that those points of view? So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What we take? Yeah, two more questions. Rasmus, say your name. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Rasmus. I'm from Copenhagen Business School. I have a question for Warren. Um, I I really have a lot of sympathy for your perspective, and I think it's really important uh, that taxes are actually a driver for the currency, mm -hmm. and government can actually spend before they tax and so on. But don't you see this? Like you're saying, it's a monopoly by the government. But don't you see today that we kind of have we have a system where it's actually private banks who create money, and I think even in Denmark the government have a, accounts at private banks, so they also collect the tax uh, in the, at the deposit <coughs> accounts in private banks. So the profit from the money creation uh, is is at the at the private banks and not at the central bank. Um, and uh, yeah, so in, in that way, there, will, there, there, there must be some kind of profit from the money creation, and that is today. It, wouldn't you agree that that, that profit is uh, at the private banks? And one more, yes. Uh, Thibaut from uh, EHSS Paris. Um, actually, uh, thank you both for your presentation. So, Mark, um, uh, thanks a lot for. Uh, making such an emphasis on um, housing and the application of housing. Have you had a look at UK data? Um, and Warren, I was um, kind of intrigued by uh, something you wrote. Monopolists set two prices, uh, the on price and the exchange price. Okay, so recently I've been working on chapter 17 of the general theory and the controversy between Schroffer Hayek and uh, Ludwig Lachmann. So you probably referred to those when you were talking about Austrian economists. And considering the way Keynes defines the, uh, the on price in the general theory, which implies the use of future markets, um, are you saying that the everyday monopolist, even like the very kind of local monopolist, considers, uh, like sets the on price via considering aspects pertaining to future price? And actually, um, wh what you said was, I mean, really made me think uh, it's true that the, what the central bank does effectively is setting the interest rate does the, the on price. Now, I wouldn't say that the interest, uh, sorry, the, the central bank sets the exchange price of money, actually. Uh, I would find that to be highly monetary. All right, Mark, would you initiate? No. So does that work? All right. Uh, the first question by David. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't think much about this, uh, the size of the components, and I, I couldn't tell you what's the relative size. Uh, yeah, I, gu I guess the only thing I can say is that we know that residential investment is the prime mover before corporate investment. Uh, about the question by uh, Kim, uh, why is it that there? Well, okay. What's the uh, long run move in residential investment, uh, to, I, w I would say probably as would Hansen say, its population would be related to that. And what about the business cycle component? I would say it's the central bank. It's the rate of interest being uh, changed by the central bank 
and we know that uh, interest rates don't have much of an impact on corporate investment, but they do have a large impact on uh, household residential investment. And Thibault, I missed you. It was, you, you asked if, I, if I, we had done something for the UK, was that? The data was um, done in the USA, right? Right, yes. So do you have no, we, no, no, we haven't, so that's the yeah. short answer. Uh, but it's true that in, uh, I mean, the evolution of residential prices in the UK is more or less similar to what has happened in the US. Okay, so taxation, unemployment. If you have no unemployment, it doesn't mean you have zero taxation. So if you have a country where the government wants to hire 5 million people and it puts on the appropriate tax, which I would suggest more often than not will be something less than the spending, there will be a deficit. Uh, then the people who it caused to be unemployed were then hired by the government, and there was no residual unemployment after that. Okay, and that's when you have your periods of full employment. Okay. Does that answer your question? Well, not exactly. <laughs> okay. I mean, you seem to imply that unemployment comes only from something having to do with government taxation. Right. Yet to most of us, I think, it seems that the private sector of the economy can generate unemployment and normally does. Yeah. Well, and you didn't say anything to counter that belief that I could hear. Okay, well that's a different question. <coughs> okay, so what happens is, is it, you know, it's always an unspent income story. Okay, so for everyone who spends less than his income, someone else has to spend more to make up for it. And so what you have is a, a need for deficit spending to offset the savings desires. Right? And so if the private sector has taken up that role, like it did in the U.S. during most of our good times uh, to uh, fill in that spending gap. Then when it collapses and the government doesn't step in and turn the steering wheel and make a fiscal adjustment, then you have unemployment. So what happens is the private sector debt is a negative savings desire. It's a negative savings. Right? And so you, you can have positive or negative savings desires in the private sector. The government will be offsetting those. So the tax creates a need to pay taxes and a desire to save. And that desire to save fluctuates wildly sometimes as private sector credit demand fluctuates. So that was, that was the longer version of my conversation. I was limited to 20 minutes. And I can do another two hours if you want to stay. <laughs> okay, now, uh, same thing with profit from money creation. Okay. Number one, even in the U.S., the government treasury bills, for example, which don't have any anticipation of them, that's just the current rate, they sell for, the, the yield on those is less than banks' cost of funds. So it doesn't make any sense to say that there's some kind of profit going on from that kind of thing. And I think uh, if you're talking about the government of issue and not some municipality, not some state like Greece or France or whatever, but the European Central Bank, when it issues 90-day uh, deposits, you'll see the rates are at or below the policy rate when it's, you know, the risk-free entity, the issue of the currency of the central bank, or its associated, you know, political entity like the U.S. Treasury. It's only in other cases where you'll see the effect of a profit, and that is a risk premium. It's not a uh, profit on what you're calling money creation. Now, the, I, the money creation process itself is when a bank makes a loan which creates a deposit, and it, does, it has a spread, and in the U.S., the latest thing I saw in net interest margin has it's been dropping, but it's down to about 3%. Okay, the cost of funds is determined by the policy rate, and then the bank decides what uh, rate it wants to charge for the loans. Now, on the lending side, the bank has to compete with other banks in the banking system to, for the lowest rate and the best terms in order to get to win the loan. And you see that happening as during good times, it gets very pro-cyclical and credit standards slip to the limits that regulators allow them to slip. And banks will compete uh, in giving borrowers better and better terms trying to get their business. The, the bank creates a deposit, but it's not the bank's money. That deposit belongs, it's, it's deposited at the bank, but it belongs to the depositor, whoever that might be. And then the bank has to compete to keep those deposits, which will shift from bank to bank depending on the interest rate. The very large deposits will switch for one or two basis points. 
Okay, so the banks are competing <coughs> on both sides. So there's no easy money in banking. You've got to compete with other banks on both sides. I owned a bank for 25 years, and if there was any easy money, I think I would have found it. It's a very difficult business unless you've got you know, some kind of proprietary thing going on. Uh, let's see. And you know, every eight or 10 years, they all crash and burn, shareholders lose all their money, they start over. And, uh, let's see, profit from money creation. I mean, own profit. <coughs> <coughs> so, there's a little bit of confusion going on here. First of all, the central bank sets the interest rate, which is the own rate for the currency. The foreign exchange rate is how that currency exchanges for something else. That would be set by spending policies of the treasury. <coughs> Unless the central bank is in buying foreign exchange, and even then, when central banks buy or sell foreign exchange, they do it on behalf of the treasury. So it's checked, like in Japan, it's the MOF that uh, directs the BOJ to do what they're doing. So, Again, it's the treasury side. Now, the own rate for, let's say, a water company would be how his water would exchange for more water. You know, if I have water and I want to sell it, you know, hold it for a year, what's the, what's the price of water in water a year from now? Okay, well, it's usually the same. They, they don't normally set an own rate. And I know the, uh, in a fixed exchange rate policy, you do have own rates because you like a gold standard because you've got an own rate of the underlying reserve, and I'm not going to get in, into that now, but in a floating exchange rate environment, <coughs> I'll, 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 let, let me end with one more thing about the own rate, the interest rate, and I've done a write-up on this, and in a very important sense, the policy rate is the rate of inflation. It doesn't influence it, it is the rate of inflation by today's definition of inflation, okay, which is inflation <coughs> is a, a continuous increase in prices faced by the economy. The measures we use for inflation, that, that's how it's defined. What we use shows what prices did last year. It's a guess at what prices did next year. It doesn't look at what prices are faced by the economy. The economy faces a whole too much of prices every day when it's making decisions <coughs> when to buy things for delivery, to buy for today's delivery, next year, the year after, if you're a supplier. Okay. When interest rates go to 10%, the, all else equal, no storage costs and no uh, uh, deterioration of the product, the cost of that product faced by the market today, whatever it is today, if it's 100 today, it's going to be 10% higher compounding every year out to the policy rate. Okay. That fits today's definition of inflation. And that, the academic definition of inflation. So in an academic sense, the, the interest policy rate set by the central bank, the term structure of rates, of risk-free rates that result, which are the anticipation of future rates, is actually the inflation rate that exists at that point in time. It is the term structure of prices faced by today's economy, today's <coughs> buyers and sellers. Thank you. Well, it was an easy task for the chairman. Yes, and sir. maybe I should make one more announcement that your book, although in Danish, is yeah. for sale here. Am I right? Yeah, apparently, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. apparently, yeah. yeah. And I think the price, there is a discount. Okay. No. Yeah, and here's the agent. I'm not, I'm not involved. I'm not involved in Okay, I dare not say that's a matter of the future price. I just want to thank you both for this. It's also been translated to Polish. Yes, I've been yes. told it's easier to understand. Yes, yes. Further <laughs> during the coffee break. Thank you.